I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. Today is Wednesday, March 27, 2024. The time is 2.38 in the afternoon, and this hearing is being held in room 412 of the Johnny Wilson Building, but it's also available online, and there are a number of witnesses who will be participating virtually. Uh, our hearings are broadcast on the, sometimes on cable television. I'm not sure if this one is, uh, but it's also available on the council's website, which is www.dccouncil.gov. The subject of today's hearing is Bill 25-576, entitled Protecting Historic Homes Amendment Act of 2023. This bill was introduced by Councilmember Allen, joined by Council Members Gray and Parker introduced on November 15th, 2023. The stated purpose of this bill is to amend the Historic Landmark and Historic District Protection Act of 1978 to protect historic homes by ensuring that civil fines, penalties, or fees assessed by the Historic Preservation Office account for the severity of the violation by raising the amount set for a class one violation to be not more than $10,000 per violation. For instances where there is substantial demolition alteration or new construction, there would be a new civil penalty that varies by degree of severity, ranging from $10,000 to $100,000 per violation. The thinking behind this is that there are some unscrupulous folks who calculate that maybe they won't get caught, and if they do get caught, the fine is worth the price of getting something new or significantly altered. And this is meant through the fine process to alter that economic equation. The record in this matter will be open for two weeks. That is, it will close at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. The hearing notice states how people can submit comments and testimony, which is through the council's hearing management system on the council's website. Uh, go to legislation. Um, Information Management System, otherwise known as LIMS, dc.dccouncil.gov slash hearings. I'll let me turn to my colleague, Councilmember Charles Allen, in case he has an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you holding today's hearing. I introduced this bill last year after a rather concerning case in Ward 6 came to my attention. Uh, this concerning case involves a home located in the Capitol Hill Historic District. In May of 2022, the Historic Preservation Review Board which is located within the Office of Planning, reviews this proposed construction for compatibility with the character of historic district, approved an application to build a rear addition at a new cellar at the home. In March 2023, alert neighbors found that nearly the entire house had been demolished, with only the front facade of the home remaining standing. They immediately contacted inspectors. The inspectors found that the work done clearly exceeded the scope of the permit, and a stop work order was issued. This case was particularly egregious and led me to write to the Office of Planning last summer requesting further information on the enforcement of our historic preservation laws. I was particularly concerned that the lack of any fines or other deterrence measures weakens our overall enforcement scheme. Currently, a property owner who fails to stay within the scope and conditions of a building permit for a historic property may be subject to a $4,187 civil infraction, which is a class one violation under the DCRA Civil Infractions Act. And that $4,187 can be imposed as a fine for something as minuscule as repointing or repairing the joints and brickwork to the outright demolition of a historic home. And I just don't think that sounds right. Doesn't seem right to me. Because one, a property owner undergoing a whole property renovation valued in the hundreds of thousands of dollars can more easily absorb the cost of that $4,187 fine. And two, I just hope that naturally we can understand certain conduct is just going to be more egregious than others and the score corresponding fines should reflect that. The bill would provide that civil fines, penalties, and fees assessed by the Historic Preservation Office within the Office of Planning and governed by the fine schedule pursuant to DCRA Civil Infractions Act can be variable by degree of severity and not be more than $10,000 per violation. Again, having the same fine for repointing and an outright demolition just isn't right. Furthermore, where we see instances where there is substantial demolition, alteration, or new construction, the bill would create a new civil penalty that would be variable by degree of severity and start off at $10,000 and not be more than $100,000 per violation. Overall, these changes would allow OP to protect historic homes in the district and prevent historic homes from being unrecoverable and lost. 
Lastly, I do want to thank the Office of Planning for its collaboration and for its engagement around this bill. Looking at, at Director Crozart's testimony already, we may not fully agree about the fine amount, but I do appreciate that o the OP team has stayed very connected with my team. I also want to thank ANC Commissioner Shroof, who has worked diligently with ANC 6B on historic preservation issues for his advocacy around this issue, as well as our public witnesses who are testifying today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, these microphones. Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Uh, so I'm going to turn now to the witnesses. And I think what I'll do is I'll call all 10. We have Rebecca Miller, who's present in the room, Gerald Sroof, who's an ANC commissioner. I did not say Rebecca Miller is executive director of DC Preservation League. Mr. Shroof is commissioner ANC 6B, uh, Valerie Jablo, Charles McMillan. Kirby Vining, who's also president and is the chair of the Historic Preservation Subcommittee of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City. Bobby Kringle, who is chair of the Capitol Hill Coalition for Sensible Development. Mary Joy Ballantyne, Darren Howell, Amelia Palma, who is director of policy and research at the DC Policy Center, and Greta Fuller, who's with the Historic Anacostia Preservation Society. So we'll begin with Ms. Miller. Hmm? Good afternoon. It's very raining outside. So. <laughs> uh, my name is Rebecca Miller. I'm the executive director of the DC Preservation League. Good afternoon. Um, we are Washington's citywide nonprofit dedicated to preserving and protecting our great city's historic and built environment. I'm pleased to present our views that are su uh, supported by the Committee of 100 on the Federal City on the proposed Protecting Historic Homes Amendment Act of 2023. DCPL welcomes the focus on problems in the enforcement of historic landmark and the Historic District Protection Act of 1978, and thanks council members Allen, Gray, and Parker for raising the profile of these issues within the council. We ask for attention um, for attention to this issue each and every year in our oversight testimony on the Office of Planning and other agencies. However, while fines may be too low and infrequently collected, increasing uh, their level without other action cannot be expected to reduce the serious problem of illegal construction in our historic districts. To begin with, the much higher proposed range of fines does not square with the established schedule of those under the Civil Infractions Act of 1985, which governs infractions under the construction codes. The Civil Infraction Act classifies all such violations as class one infractions, the highest level available under the act. They are defined as egregious infractions that result from flagrant, fraudulent, or willful conduct, unlicensed activity, or that um, are imminently dangerous to the health, safety, or welfare of persons within the District of Columbia. Fines are assessed based on the class, duration, number of violations, and other considerations that can, in theory, result in a very significant fine for individual properties. If that is not occurring for construction code violations affecting historic properties, why isn't it? That is a question the council needs to probe before considering whether changes are needed to the Historic Preservation Act. Another critical factor that needs to be taken into account is the role of the Office of Administrative Hearings, the body charged with making final decisions on fines for civil infractions and collecting those fines. At present, there's no public access to any information about individual OAH cases. Between September 2017 and 19, OAH posted some categories of final orders on its website including those from OP and DCRA. A review of the 52 OP orders posted revealed that most did not include the street address and none used square and lot, which is standard practice for historic preservation and zoning cases, making it all but impossible to identify the location of the violations and to match fines to actions taken by other agencies. Fines were generally, um, fines were payments were never made. So it's hard to tell if anything was ever made. In contrast, where fines were contested, fines were generally reduced, often significantly, and seemingly with the consent of HPO, whose representatives sometimes initiated dismissals of the fines. In other words, fines today are used in the enforcement process primarily as leverage to get the property owner to correct violations. They are not seen by enforcement personnel as penalties required for illegal behavior, above and beyond the cost of any corrective action that should be taken. Thus, fines have been very limited if any deterrent effect on illegal, have been limited on their effect on illegal construction. May I continue? Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, fundamentally, um, perhaps enforcement of the construction code is seriously hampered by the small number and limited reach of enforcement personnel at the Historic Preservation Office and Department of Buildings. Enforcement officers were first introduced to HPO in the late 1990s at the request of the preservation community because of DCRA's lack of effectiveness. HPO now has three enforcement officers, but they cannot handle the many violations affecting historic properties. They work with their DOB counterparts, but that relationship is not well understood by DCPL. Even together, they cannot be expected to control a daily widespread illegal construction in historic districts and elsewhere in the city. To our knowledge, enforcement action is all too often uh, based on reports from neighbors who, who wonder, but without access to approved plans, cannot know for certain whether what is being built down the street has been properly permitted. An open discussion of the relationship between HPO and DOB inspectors and how their joint enforcement actions can be improved is overdue. Approved building plans must also be readily available to the public, particularly where, when staff levels at HPO and DOB remain insufficient to provide the oversight needed. Demolitions of historic homes of the kind that occurred recently on Capitol Hill and inspired the current bill are rare. In such cases, the Historic Preservation Review Board has the authority to and does require that they be rebuilt. Another recent case of this kind involved a house at 3515 Woodley Park Northwest in Cleveland Park where serious contractor error was involved. And similarly at 1730 Kenyon Street Northwest in Mount Pleasant where the entire facade was removed when the contractor was supposed to be repairing the superficial damage left from Formstone. Um, HPRB required that all these houses be rebuilt. There was also a freestanding garage in Mount Pleasant that HPO required to be rebuilt some years ago. Would higher fines issued under the, the, under the authority of the HP Act have produced better results in these cases? That seems really unlikely. HPRB required these houses to, to be rebuilt. However, since contractor error, deliberate or otherwise, is always involved, the institution of penalties for contractors, such as publicly listing violators or suspending and or revoking licenses of repeat violators might be more effective than fines to homeowners. Theoretically, a contractor's license on the line may deter them from making detrimental decisions that would negatively affect the historic resource or give the contractor traction in declining an owner's illegal direction. DC should also examine the experience of other jurisdictions, New York, Philly, maybe Chicago, in some jurisdictions like DC, an illegal demolition can result in reconstruction without extra square footage, lot coverage, et cetera. Other cities without the, re the reconstruction provision do not allow development on the site for up to three years, and the development cannot be larger than the structure that was illegally raised. Uh, we're not sure if that can work in DC, but it's, it, or if it's a great alternative. So in conclusion, uh, DCPL would like to take the opportunity to call upon you to convene a roundtable with pertinent agencies and concerned citizens and organizations to explore current problems in preservation enforcement in detail sufficient to develop a plan for reform that might include legislative, organizational, budgetary, and other need changes. Thank you. And thank you for the extra time. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Commissioner Shroof. Uh, he appears not to be here. Valerie Jablo. Hi, I am Valerie Jablo, and since 1991, I have lived in the historic district of Capitol Hill. Like many here, my house was built in the late 19th century and was much more affordable in the 1990s than now. I've endeavored to take good care of it and its many original features, doors, floors, windows, plaster and wood moldings, beams and staircase. For decades, this historic house has been my comfortable and livable home. But since about 2000, my house has also become worthless outside its walls, except as an investment engine. Most DC residents cannot afford to buy my house, including me, if I did not already own it. When it is sold, it likely will be gutted, if not torn down completely to the front wall, like so many others here. That's because all the lovely features that make my and countless other DC houses comfortable and livable, and often as an, often as an aside, historic, don't really count in the way DC rules with housing. What counts, maybe what is always counted here, is the power that money and gentrification bring. I've seen this repeatedly in how houses are treated across DC and in my own historic district. For instance, years ago, my report of illegal demolition of an historic house, 326 A Street Southeast, was greeted with disbelief by HPRB. After I sent pictures in, HPRB only reluctantly sent out an inspector. 
Of course, it was all too late. Apart from pieces of the household away in a trash bin, a neighbor saw some materials from the demolished house carefully loaded onto a truck. Presumably, someone got a nice price for something historic. The house that exists now at that same address is a Disney facade of its historic predecessor. Certainly, it is not the only one in our historic district in which this is true. But like all the properties where those vanished historic houses once stood, the current house at 326A Southeast is worth so much more because it is bright and large and 100% modern, not like its historic predecessor, which despite its unique and historic status, had been left vacant and decrepit for years without any DC agency taking note. Incredibly, an HPRB staffer noted that what happened at 326A Southeast was a mistake. Since nearly all DC houses, and not just those in historic districts, are apparently worth only what they can realize for those who trade in them for profit, having larger fines as this legislation outlines will help, but certainly not stop, the profitable destruction of our houses, which is most certainly not a mistake. And as the value of most DC houses far exceeds $100,000, even a fine as large as that can easily be absorbed as a cost of doing business. Thus, as I outlined in testimony to you five years ago about 326A Southeast, you should do much more in addition to fines to stop our houses and neighborhoods being reduced to investment engines. One, ensure no agency issues permits for renovations if any structure has been vacant for more than a year and not appropriately taxed as such or has property taxes due. Two, ensure no agency issues multiple renovation permits for any vacant properties over any period longer than two years to the same owners with no work done, which suggests the owners are pursuing an excused delay for demolition by neglect. If the same owner is pulling multiple permits for multiple DC agency properties in a short time span, lack of property tax payments, neglect, or illegal construction in any of the properties should act as an immediate break on permit approvals for all involved. Three, make owners of historic properties notify HPRB ahead of all major demolition so an inspector can be present for it and fine owners when they do not comply. Four, ban contractors and architects from working in D.C. if they commit egregious violations. If tearing down an entire historic house is regarded as a mistake, the people who do that are, at the very least, endangering the public with gross incompetence. Five, make tax assessment real progressive and timely. Boarded up windows years running are a clear sign that a house is both vacant and decrepit, which should immediately signal a change in tax status. Finally, I am not getting paid for one syllable of this testimony, but someone reading it or listening now is getting paid to ignore every word or to tell you to ignore it. Until that's addressed, instituting fines alone cannot make a meaningful change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chablow. Charles McMillan. Charles McMillan. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, hold on. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, thank you for your work on this issue that is vital to sustaining the excellent quality of life that keeps so many of us living in our great city. My DC native wife and I have lived in the Capitol Hill Historic District for 37 wonderful years. However, about 20 years ago, a Virginia developer bought the home three houses away from us, lying about his family's plan to occupy it and ignoring our common historic district protections. He made major exterior and interior alterations to maximize occupancy while ignoring a series of stop work orders. I'll spare you the decades of dreary details, but despite claiming a homestead exemption, he never moved into the house or into the district. Aside from the non-conforming facade, the not to code renovations caused years of ongoing major sewage and other expensive problems for the immediate neighbors and, and for DC agencies. agencies. It continues to operate as an eyesore Airbnb for unsuspecting tourists. Raising the potential fine to as much as $100,000 for ignoring HPRB's community protections or even for totally destroying a contributing structure is essential but grossly insufficient because of the uniquely valuable public environment our, H, our historic district has created. Homes within the historic district already regularly sell 
uh, in the two hundred uh, in the two million dollar range and more. A potential cap of a hundred thousand dollars will remain simply a cost of doing business for those seeking free rider public benefits in our communities at the expense of the rest of us. If the council needs to pass this important um, amendment, stopgap amendment immediately, then please do so quickly and unanimously. But as soon as possible, the, count, the council should eliminate any monetary cap on fines for destroying structures or elements in violation of historic district protections and substitute the common sense requirement and enforce it for prompt, total, and complete replacement of damaged structures or elements, replacements that are acceptable to HPRB. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mc Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Kirby Vining. I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I'm uh, Kirby Vining, Chair of the Historic Preservation Subcommittee of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City, testifying in opposition to Bill 25-576, typo in my uh, testimony, on behalf of the Committee of 100. The Committee of 100 celebrated its centennial in 2023, marking 100 years as an independent citizens planning group advocating for sound decisions in the planning, zoning, transportation, historic preservation, parks, and open space conservation in support of the distinct beauty and community character of the nation's capital. The Committee of 100 strongly supports an active and effective program of enforcement to respond to the violations of the city's historic landmark and historic district protection act of 1978 and we commend the council for considering this important issue we agree with the premise of bill 25576 that there needs to be more effective deterrence for the unauthorized and therefore illegal demolition or alteration of designated historic structures in the district of columbia it is our view however that the problem with this well-intentioned bill is designed to address largely results from a failure to effectively enforce existing law. Consequently, we endorse the testimony provided by the DC Preservation League, encouraging the council to address the serious understaffing of enforcement personnel, the need for stronger commitment on the part of city officials to penalize offenders beyond the cost of corrective action, the overlapping jurisdiction of city enforcement personnel, the absence of relevant reporting data from city agencies, the need for better public access to building permits and plans, and the need to explore whether there may be opportunities, particularly under existing law, to penalize repeat offenders through tools such as suspension or revocation of licenses. We support DCPL's call for the council to convene a round table with agencies and computing community stakeholders to explore current problems in preservation enforcement in detail sufficient to address the fundamental roots of this ongoing problem. Thank you for your attention to our comments above, and you should have a copy of our statement sent in yesterday. I do have it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Bobby Kringle. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you. Um, I'm trying to get Okay, I'm trying to get the, there we go. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and council members. My name is Bobby Kringle and I serve as chair of the Capitol Hill Coalition for Sensible Development. Thank you for taking up this important matter of historic preservation and this sorely needed new legislation. It will certainly help and I urge you to pass it. However, the lack of reliable enforcement remains a critical issue and it is generally accepted that increasing the severity of punishment is less, ex less effective than increasing the certainty of apprehension. In addition, unfortunately, there are so many instances of government failure that it will not address. So um, I would like to plead instead for help with one 
specific example of such failure now occurring on the on Capitol Hill. A critically mistaken approval of an application for exterior alteration via the use of the deceptive nomenclature, which desperately needs proper review by the Historic Preservation Review Board. A significant alteration to the exterior of the 1895 Epworth Church Building at 700 A Street Northeast has been wrought by the installation of an additional new layer of window coverings over the older plexiglass panes still in place which are themselves installed over its historic stained glass windows, effectively obscuring them such that what was previously visible from the public space is no longer visible. In his June 13, 2013 final decision in order, the mayor's agent reconfirmed the establishment of these stained glass windows as quote, historic windows, special windows under the regulations imposing more stringent rec requirements for alteration than for ordinary windows. Undeniably a character defining feature of a major building in the historic district visible from the public street and important visual features of the exterior of the church building, unquote. Yet the application was approved by deceptively renaming the project as replacement of storm windows. These new additional coverings cannot be considered storm windows because storm windows are clear and visible except for minimal frames and do not alter or change the appearance of a building or its windows. These are vision obscuring panels which have changed the appearance of the windows and of the building. Erroneously labeling the project as replacement of storm windows critically ignores the impact to the appearance of the building and thereby has circumvented a more appropriate review process, effectively shutting it down by a false definition that should not be allowed to stand as dispositive. The effect of this alteration, rendering the stained glass windows invisible is not so very different from removing them and gives the impression of being boarded up or blocked up eerily similar to window openings that have been filled in with concrete block or secured with sheet metal. It now looks abandoned. The only response from the Historic Preservation Office staff has been continually to repeat that under building, current building code, a permit is not required for storm windows rather than understanding that something which is permitted under the building code might be prohibited under historic preservation regulations. This is exactly why it should have been sent to HBRB for a closer review, which is to suspend any label of what this project is and look at the question of whether there has been an exterior alteration. The four vacancies on that board are deeply regrettable, but must not be allowed to prevent appropriate and necessary review. And I thank you very much for your consideration of this important matter. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kringle. Uh, Mary Joy Ballantyne. Ms. Ballantyne. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Just a moment. I'm trying to fix my computer. So I just found out about this hearing um, on Monday, and I have not had time to finalize my comments, but I'll hopefully convey um, what I would like to share. So my name is Mary Joy Valentine, and I purchased my home, my historic home, um, in the historic district about 24 years ago. I just want to say that I strongly support the council's actions to strengthen protections of historic homes and to try and deter developers and others from violating existing law. But in my experience, this bill could be strengthened by clarifying the levels of severity of the violations and the fines associated with each level of severity. Currently as drafted, it seems to be vague as to what a severe violation would be and what fine would be associated with that. And if it's not clear enough, then as others have already mentioned, it won't act as a deterrent, but it will rather be something that people budget for when they want to conduct renovations on a historic home that they don't want to um, apply for a permit and, and get a permit for. Um, 
somebody already mentioned that the homes in the historic district are one of the most expensive homes in the district. And again, unless the fines are sufficiently high, and even if they are, it's unlikely that there will be a deterrent. So council member Allen mentioned that the action that triggered this bill was the near complete demolition of a historic home located at 639 A Street Southeast. But what council member Allen may not be aware of is that the same team, the same architect, the same contractor and the same developer responsible for that demolition um, received that permit to conduct that work while they were under a stop work order for doing exactly the same thing to the home next door to mine. They came into the home next door to mine under a permit for a light renovation and they proceeded to gut the entire um, property and then um, excavate under our home where there were no footings. And so as a result, we incurred about $30,000 worth of damage which took us years to get. And that stop work order wasn't lifted for about two and a half years. But at the same time, we were unaware that they got this other permit and did the same thing to another historic home across um, Capitol Hill. So the bottom line, as other people have already mentioned, is that the same team, the same architect, the same contractor, the same developer um, did exactly the same thing to two homes at the same time. And I would suggest as others already have, I'm a lawyer. If I break the law, my license comes under question. And I think that's a more, is an, it's a better way to deter people who have um, conducted illegal construction in the district. So I would, as others have already said, strengthen the preservation of the homes by making it so excuse me, by making sure to preserve the homes so that they're not destroyed and then they get fined, but so that the, the licenses are on the line as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ballantyne. I don't have a copy of your statement. I think you said you'd be sending it. Yes, I'm gonna Please. make a statement, a real one that is coherent and I will submit that to the record. Oh, you were coherent, but thank you. Sure. So we'll look forward to getting that. Thank you. Uh, Darren Howell. Don't believe he's here. Amelia Alma with the DC Policy Center. Hello. Please proceed. Hi, thank you, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is Amelia Alma and I'm the Director of Research and Policy at the DC Policy Center. We're an independent nonpartisan think tank advancing policies for a strong, competitive, compelling and vibrant District of Columbia. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify on this bill. The pandemic has fundamentally changed the way in which people choose where to work and live. It used to be that residents came here for employment and often left for housing reasons. Now with telework, commute times are much less important and having a job here is not as a compelling reason to move as it was before. And as such, having attractive and affordable housing options in DC has become more and more important in making DC competitive. Thus, our housing policy is now important economic development policy. So while we agree that demolition without a permit is certainly a loss and should be prohibited, we think that policy decisions regarding historic designation should fully evaluate the costs associated with repairs and improvements in historic districts that might make these DC neighborhoods more expensive and therefore less attractive to new residents, as well as the reasons for why these demolitions occur. Historic preservation pre presents a trade-off between preserving neighborhood appearance and housing affordability and growth, and this trade-off should be properly understood. DC has 70 historic districts, 37 of which are in residential neighborhoods, and across all of these residential buildings in DC, 17% of them are classified as historic. The majority of these, over 90%, were built before 1950, and 40% of them were built before 1900, making the need for external repairs pretty commonplace. However, review and rules imposed by historic designation make repairs costly to compete, complete for property owners, limiting both who can own property in historic districts and who can afford the necessary repairs. And Going along with that, as many people have mentioned already in this hearing, these high costs allow some contractors and owners to absorb these fines. 
So instead of changing the penalties for violating historic preservation rules, we recommend that the council consider the following questions. How do historic preservation goals fit into the city's other priorities, such as increasing housing and continuing housing affordability? The board's goal is to preserve the history and look of certain neighborhoods in the city, but this must be balanced by housing preservation goals, new housing development, and should not place undue costs on homeowners in these neighborhoods. Secondly, how do historic preservation status contribute to the costs of homeowners in DC? The costs associated with permitting completing historically compatible repairs can significantly increase the cost of home ownership in the district. This can limit who's able to purchase homes in certain areas and make it harder for homeowners to make the necessary repairs, even if they're in line with the historic character. However, these costs are not well understood or documented. And we recommend the council explore how historic preservation status contributes to housing values, repair costs, and neighborhood demographics. Regarding the changing of the enforcement rules itself, uh, we would like to know how the enforcement mechanism for violating permits in historic district, if it produces the desired results. Currently, properties aren't inspected unless neighborhoods or concerned parties call in problems. However, we have no idea the rate at which permits are violated. And yearly revenue collections suggest that fines are very infrequently levied. So there seems to be a disconnect between the permitting process and the construction processes. And if this is the case, then increasing the penalties for alterations and demolitions may not have the desired effect of preserving historic structures. And instead, enforcement would actually be a better lever. And uh, additionally, we'd like to consider what circumstances have previously led to the demolition of properties without a permit and who has previously received fines for permit violations. I think this will help answer whether fines have been previously levied against developers or homeowners, as well as if the issue of demolition without a permit is pervasive. And finally, we would just like to ask how the Office of Planning is to determine the severity of these infractions and thereby the imposed fines, as the legislation pre presents a very large range of outcomes without guidance on, how, um, on which actions will produce what penalties. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Comer. Uh, Greta Fuller, I believe you're in the waiting room. You need to accept. Ms. Fuller? I do know she was listening because she asked if it had started, so. I know she was in the, uh, what? She keeps declining to be promoted. But I think she needs to click on a different icon. She says she's trying to join. It says connecting now. Ms. Fuller, you're making progress. We almost see you.
Uh, we see you and we might even hear you if you say something. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. It just kept saying connecting. So let me hurry up and begin. Uh, first of all, my name is Greta Fuller. I live in historic Anacostia. And I like to uh, have it go on record that historic preservation does not stop affordable housing as living in historic Anacostia. We have 16 new 100% affordable uh, units coming to one, I mean, 16 100% affordable projects coming to our very small historic district. So I can say advently, because where I live, that we have affordable housing and historic Anacostia uh, does not prevent uh, affordable housing. And now to get to what's really at stake here, and that are that is the um, misuse by um, developers and and um, and small businesses that come into historic communities are not just small businesses, but construction companies that come into uh, historic communities and don't follow the permits that they are given. And uh, one of the most concerning practices for me is the deliberate avoidance of circumvention of historic preservation regulations and guidelines. Instead of adhering to the established guidelines, some individuals choose to cut corners, compromise in historic integrity, and prioritize short-term profits over, over long-term preservation goals. This not only erodes the character of our historic district, but also diminishes our cultural identity and heritage. The persistence of unpermitted work in historic district poses a significant threat to the integrity of our invaluable assets. Failure to obtain proper permits and approvals not only violate regulatory requirements, but also undermine the trust and accountability necessary for responsible development and confuses homeowners who are trying to do the right thing. It goes without saying, unpermitted alterations and additions can irreversibly alter the character of historic districts, distracting from their authenticity and diminishing their historic significance. Historic preservation guidelines exists not merely to bear not merely as bureaucratic red tape but as crucial framework for enhancing and safeguarding the character of our historic districts these guidelines are, metis, are meticulously crafted to ensure that any alterations or developments respect the authenticity and historical significance of the area however it is deeply concerning to note the increasing frequency with which these guidelines are being being ignored or circumvented. Moreover, the failure to remove the unpermitted work compounds the problem, perpetuating the degradation of our historic landscape by allowing unauthorized alterations to remain unchecked and blighted. We not only condone the erosion of our cultural heritage, but also set a dangerous precedence that undermines the very foundation of the preservation efforts. It is imperative that we hold accountable those responsible for flouting preservation guidelines and failing to rectify their unauthorized actions. These necessities um, with enforcement mechanisms, stringent penalties for noncompliance will help uh, our communities not live with the blight that's left behind by unpermitted work. We cannot afford to ignore the violations. Unchecked and underfined illegal development in historic district goes beyond mere appearance. It erodes our collective identity and our connection to place. Each unauthorized alteration is not just a loss for us, but the future generations are deprived of experiencing our authentic history. Neighbors shouldn't have to endure illegal structures and blight for years, there must be consequences, sti stiff fines and notices from the appropriate agencies must be taken swift, 
swiftly and consistently. The Historic Preservation Office and Department of Buildings or whomever should collaborate to ensure swift actions on violations. DOB must follow up with owners, contractors, and developers to address illegal structures and illegal work promptly and prevent these from becoming a blight in our community. We ask that the violations not be able to remain for years if I have seen time and time again in my community, which causes blight. In addition to these challenges, the lack of enforcement and accountability worsens the situation, allowing dishonest individuals to disregard regulations without consequence. It is relevant it is crucial for relevant authorities to take decisive action to address these issues and hold violators responsible for their actions. And I would like to finish with something that actually happened on the 1300 block of Maple View Place Southeast. I'm not going to give the address for the owner isn't on this call. But despite receiving a stop work order, the developer proceeded with the project promising to rectify the issues before leaving the property untouched for over a year. He got to stop work. He promised he would correct it, but he didn't. Subsequently, the property was listed for sale and the unknown violations did not follow the property. The property was bought by a new homeowner. And when the new homeowner went to HPO to do some work in their house and follow the, the laws of the historic preservation guidelines of historic Anacostia, they were told they had a stop work on the property. When they found that out, nothing was checked when they went and did their title check. So we have to do some cross-referencing to make sure that these stop work follow the property. The developer is long gone, and now the homeowner is stuck with these violations. This must not happen to people who have no idea of what's going on. And just like someone else said, that developer has a license and he's still doing work in the District of Columbia. He should not be allowed to do any other work in the district until he has made the property that he destroyed whole of the homeowner in our community and all over DC. This isn't the first time I've heard of it. I've heard it from several different people, from Bloomingdale to Capitol Hill to uh, Adams Morgan. Uh, we cannot allow such misconduct by developers and contractors to persist in D.C. Strong measures must be taken immediately and license must be restricted. As a community, we must collectively recognize the importance of preserving our historic districts. Thank you for considering my testimony. I will submit my actual written testimony. I kind of skipped around because I was late, but I urge you to provide the enforcement of historic preservation guidelines and um, and work with, as Rebecca said, from DC Preservation League with a group of personnel to help address this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fuller, and it's good to see you. If you could submit your statement, that would be great. I will, thank you. Uh, so that concludes the uh, witnesses uh, who have a round of questions. I think where I want to go is just to ask uh, Ms. Miller a few questions. Uh, there was some testimony which you heard, and it reminds me of a theme of testimony when we had the performance oversight of the Office of Planning a few weeks ago. Uh, folks who were testifying that historic districts are too many and counterproductive, economically damaging. Uh, so um, I, what I'm looking at is this, um, this, which I'll read. How do histor historic preservation goals fit into the city's other priorities, such as increased housing and continuing housing affordability? You want to take a stab at some of this? Well, certainly. I mean, as you heard, Ms. Fuller, there's a number of uh, projects that are happening within historic districts. 18% um, uh, on average is the number of uh new units that are delivered within historic districts or historic landmarks between 2016 and now. Uh, we've been running those numbers since then, and that's from the DC Economic Partnership. So uh, so historic districts are adding uh, properties. 
I think one of the challenges in historic districts um, is a lot of times, I'll, I'll give you some examples. There are properties in Bloomingdale, for instance. I'm, I'm actually currently shopping for a house. Um, I find very often that developers are coming in and they pay the cash. Um, there's a property on W Street on the unit block, which last June of last year sold for $7.69. It's now in the market for $1.4, which I mean, they're doubling the price of that. So those are the types of things that make neighborhoods unaffordable. It's not that you can't have new housing built because you can. We've proven it with our kind of steady 18% within these historic districts. Uh, we encourage housing. Um, naturally occurring affordable housing happens in historic districts and specifically in row house neighborhoods. Uh, so I would I would argue that that is, is, is a false um, accusation. Also, um, I know that there's always a lot of talk about 20% of the city being designated and whatnot. And while I was looking around at what other cities are doing, 34% uh, of New Orleans, for instance, is designated. So far greater than DC. Uh, so it just it really depends on, you know, what the the values of the community are, and they can all balance each other out. We want additional housing. And we don't have actually, we don't lack really housing in the district. We lack affordable housing. And so this push over the last 20 years and the policies to have, I, I walk through from LaDroit Park through U Street and it's everything that's being built. It just says units of luxury housing, luxury housing, luxury housing. And that's not necessarily what we need. We need units that are affordable for, the, for our community. Well, how about this? How does historic preservation status contribute to the costs of homeowners in DC? Uh, I would also argue that because I've had a few quotes done on several of the row houses inside and outside historic districts. Um, and I would say that depending on what you want to do is dependent on how much things are going to cost. For instance, if you buy in a historic district and say you have your original wood windows, it may cost you $75,000 to have those windows uh, restored. And you may want to change those windows out the Historic Preservation Office has guidelines. They, of course, would encourage the wood windows, but they have guidelines that they look to in order for replacement windows as well. Uh, so I, I would argue that with the different estimates that I've received on houses inside and outside historic districts, they have been fairly comparable. Say that again? That estimates that I've received, construction estimates on houses as I've been looking for houses, um, received inside and outside historic districts have been comparable. So with windows, just to pick on that for a moment, um, if a person wants to replace the windows exactly as they were, that is historically, that could cost a fair amount? Well, restoring historic windows. So restoring. if it has its original windows and restoring, I mean, if we're talking, you know, three-story row house or something like that, the windows would cost about between, it's, you know, it's it's all relative per window and its level of deterioration. Restoring, but under historic preservation, one doesn't have to restore the windows, they could replace them, correct? Yes. And replacing them, there would be guidelines they have to follow. Correct. Uh, and it adds like tens of thousands of dollars to the cost of the windows? No, because you could put the same window in a non-historic building as well. There's certain guidelines that you need to follow under the historic preservation regulations, but those have also um, continued to kind of move in different directions. Uh, I think I'll pass or give it up for the moment. Councilman Brown, do you have questions for any of the witnesses? Thank you, I do. Um, I think one of the things I'm, I, first off, I appreciate everybody's testimony. I think what I'm, one of the things I'm kind of struck by is um, the bill is fairly narrow in its scope. And a lot of the testimony I'm hearing is really expanding out a lot of our historic district needs. And so um, I wanna be careful in how do we help address many of the issues that were brought up through the testimony, but also, make sure we're actually trying to address at least the one scope here that we're trying to get done. Um, one of the things that I, I heard a couple of times, and Ms. Miller, I might ask if you can weigh in on this as well, is the legislation intentionally 
is not overly prescriptive in terms of defining severity and defining amounts presents a range. And as the legislature, we frequently find ourselves in a position where if we write it all down in great detail, we're told that's overly prescriptive, the law is, is too narrow, and you really need to let the experts and the agency be able to define what that looks like. Or when we don't do it, it's, well, this is awfully vague, and we don't know what did that what you actually mean. So I got to find the landing spot somewhere in there. I don't want to be overly prescriptive in that the agency, which is supposed to have the experts and expertise, um, is it's too rigid. But at the same time, I don't want to leave it vague uh, in a way that we don't feel is implementable. How do you think we should think about that tension of what within legislation should be defined in a way to make sure it's effective? And then I'll come back in a moment, of course, when we talk about inspectors and things like that to make it effective. Uh, certainly. Um, I'm a hundred thousand dollars is I think the largest fine that I would have seen anywhere in any of the cities that I've looked in with regards to those types of fines. I think the challenge with the way that the bill is written as well is it's defining intent. I mean, I think we can talk about some of the examples that you heard of where a second time offender did this. Um, and that obviously shows intent, but it also then kind of puts the historic preservation staff on the line of having to determine what said fine is, and which can cause some tension there. Um, I think you also have the issue that since most of the enforcement, or I should say all of the enforcement is done um, under the DC code, that this is just prescribed to historic preservation. And for those individuals who uh, want preservation walked back in some way or whatnot will just say, look how expensive it is. If you do this, they can, they can, bill, they can fine you up to $100,000. And that's the only place in the city where you're going to be fined that is because it's attached to the historic preservation law. So I think those are some of the challenges that we specifically have in it. And in order for something to be, and as you heard from Capitol Hill, $2 million condos or $2 million houses, $100,000 really doesn't deter some individuals. But it's a heck of a lot more than $4,000, right? I don't so, I mean, disagree. Let me, just, let me jump back in because I mean, $4,000, if I'm doing a minor, legitimately, I intend to do a minor amount of work, there's an honest mistake that's made. Um, a $4,000 fine might be deeply impactful, or I think you, you appropriately pointed out, oftentimes the fine is actually used as leverage to cure what it was that took place in, in the first place. Um, not necessarily to deter, but if I'm, you know, and Ms. Ballantyne, I want to turn to you uh, as well on this. If I'm kind of trying to cheat the system and I'm going to say it's a light renovation, I'm just going to go and do substantial and tear it apart. Yeah, four thousand dollars. I'm just going to. It's a rounding error, base at most, right? Hundred thousand dollars on a four hundred thousand dollar renovation. I would like to avoid that if I can, and so I do think that's it's meaty, but obviously there's a lot of devil of details about how would you actually accomplish it. Um, since my time is ticking down, I do want to ask Miss Ballantyne if she can weigh in. Um, you talked, Miss Ballantyne, about this specific example I was citing, and then what you were seeing next door. What do you, I, I wrestled with this when we were drafting this of whether or not we should be trying to go after, like who has the strongest motivation to help make sure that it's done right? Is it going to be the property owner or is it going to be the contractor? And one of my fears about going after the contractors is you get a contractor who's going to essentially just fold their company and then reorganize themselves in a, in a different way and just kind of keep going. But based on your own experience, which sounded like a substantial demolition next door, do you, do you feel like it would be more effective to go after the property owner or go after the contractor? Oh, and Miss Ballantyne apparently dropped off. Well, I guess we'll ask her for her expertise on that later. Um, all right, let me try to go back if I can then. Uh, Ms. Miller, did you want to chime in on that one? Uh, one of the reasons that we suggest, uh, yes, they can reorganize. Um, that's a lot of, so a great deal of the legal work that happens in historic districts is done by LLCs. Um, your, your kind of average Joe homeowner isn't necessarily doing this kind of work. Um, and they can also, the developers, for instance, can just reorganize themselves as um, another LLC as well. Um, you know, there's, again, as you said, devil's in the details. But I think from a contractor perspective, um, especially as as was mentioned by Ms. Valentine, that 
this is now the second time that this contractor has done it. And, you know, the first time somebody can say, whoops, the next time it's, well, that was deliberate. You understand that you should be asking the historic preservation offices if this is meets the permits. And I think if your license is on the line, that it's, that's a really important factor. Um, and maybe it is, you know, whoever the overseeing architect is too. I mean, who are we ha holding accountable? Because there are cases where the owner will say, ignore that, I'll t I get fined anyway. And so the contractor will just go ahead and do the work that they are asked to do. But I think in this case, somebody trying to preserve their reputation um, would decline to do the work that is asked of them that may be outside of the permit. Yeah, I think we wrestle with that a little bit because I I don't think the homeowner, in most cases, the homeowner isn't doing the work themselves or having a contractor come in. Um, but I except in a situation when it's perhaps just, it's a developer who's trying to, um, who's just trying to gut and flip a house. If it's a, if it's the homeowner who's going to be an owner occupied, probably you're going to be highly incentivized to try to want to get it done. Right. Um, but I also feel like from a developer standpoint, if they are trying to come in and flip to make a profit and they're like, yeah, we'll just eat part of the fines are going to come with this, um, a heftier fine will have a deterrent effect. Um, so I, I look forward to keep working on this to try to think about how to get the, how to get it right. What I don't want to do though is also have, like, I, I just don't think the system we have right now is working. And so I don't want the perfect to be the end of the good. And so while I heard a lot of testimony that kind of touched on a lot of different aspects of, of historic districts, um, I, I would just caution that I don't, while all those pieces need to keep working, and I am always concerned when there's a recommendation to create task forces that it just kind of delays taking action on anything for another 12 months. Um, I would like for us to think about how to take a bite and certainly keep working with the task force, certainly working with others to kind of keep at the other pieces that have been mentioned as well. Um, I just would not want us to not move forward on something because we have 10 more things we got to make sure we get included um, because otherwise that means this is waiting. And I think we've seen acute examples of where um, this fine or the current structure is not working. And then I think to your point, you raised this and, and uh, Ms. Javelo did and others too. If we don't support the staffing of the agencies to actually have the ability to get out there, do those inspections um, and do that work, they're constantly um, under-resourced and understaffed to actually be able to, to protect it. So it doesn't matter what's on the books. Uh, if no one catches them, if no one's, able to, no one's able to actually get it done, it doesn't matter what we put on the piece of paper because it'll never get implemented and it'll never go into action. Ms. Miller, can you turn your mic on? You um, thank you. Uh, I would respond that enforcement's only as good as their training as well. Uh, I'm very familiar with other properties where the, the person who was turning it, they purchased the house. It was, a, it was actually um, a rent controlled property. Uh, the person who purchased it Toped out, it was all toped out, and then um, they renovated it to be a full time Airbnb. Well, they put in a permit to, <laughs> to <laughs> for kitchen cabinets and things that you actually don't need a permit for. And the, the neighbor was the ANC commissioner, called this in, and the inspector came out and said that they were within the scope of their permit and that they were not doing any um, additional work. They added two extra bedrooms two extra bathrooms, two kitchens, <laughs> like because it's a three level row house. Mm -hmm. And the inspector just chose to ignore that. And so I think that's part of the frustration as well within historic districts uh, is that inspectors are not necessarily seeing what we're all seeing, or they're just saying, oh, okay, or you know, what's happening, I don't know. I don't disagree with you. I don't know if the legislation is gonna address that because I can't legislate better training. Um, but I think it all goes together because again, it doesn't matter what we put on the piece of paper if it's not being able to be implemented the right way. So um, I think that's that's where we need the legislation to be paired with budget, to be paired with oversight, to keep working on all those pieces together. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, time and testimony today. I know I'm well over my time, Mr. Chair. So let me turn back to you. Uh, thank you, Councilman Rayland. Uh, thank you to each of the witnesses. I have no further questions. Um, and uh, I think a couple of you, maybe just one of you, two of you, uh, we're going to get us your statements. We'll turn now to the Director of the Office of Planning, Anita Kozart.
and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Councilmember Allen, and staff of the Committee of the Whole. I'm Anita Kozart, Director of the DC Office of Planning. Today, I'm pleased to testify on Bill 25576, the Protecting Historic Homes Amendment Act of 2023, which would amend the Historic Landmark and Historic District Protection Act of 1978, also known as Preservation Law. The Historic Preservation Office within the Office of Planning works to protect the historic character of the district through the designation of historic properties, review of permit applications affecting historic properties, and by taking enforcement action when it learns of work being done on a historic property without the required approvals. OP's historic preservation enforcement efforts are conducted under the Building Code Supplements of 2017, known as the Building Code in coordination with the Department of Buildings and is authorized by preservation law. OP issues stop work orders, corrective orders, and notice of, notices of infraction for work done without a building permit or work exceeding the scope of a building permit. A stop work order halts construction activity until required approvals are obtained and can have a fine associated with it, but rarely does. A corrective order directs a property owner to perform remedial work and warns that failure to perform remedial work may result in a fine. Both stop work orders and corrective orders are effective immediately and can be appealed to the Office of Administrative Hearings. A notice of infraction assesses a fine, but a property owner does not need to pay the fine until ordered by the Office of Administrative Hearings to do so. On a related note, during the COVID-19 pandemic, when the pace of OAH proceedings slowed, the Historic Preservation Office increased the use of corrective orders to resolve violations. That effort proved to be successful and avoided the often drawn out process associated with prosecuting a notice of infraction before OAH. But regardless of enforcement action taken, our enforcement officers prioritize bringing historic historic properties into compliance because that preserves the district's rich character. The Historic Preservation Office typically brings notices of infraction under the building code, excuse me, the current fine amount for a building code violation begins at $4,872 as noted previously in the hearing. Under the building code, each day that a violation goes uncorrected is considered a separate violation. So the fine for a single underlying violation can be multiplied. Further, a property owner responsible for a second or third violation, which can include a failure to take corrective action, is subject to double and triple fines of $9,744 and $14,616. The fact that the fines can be increased until a property owner comes into compliance with historic requirements motivates property owners to make necessary repairs and is one of the major benefits of conducting enforcement under the building code. The Protecting Historic Homes Amendment Act is introduced would dramatically increase the potential fine amounts for violations of preservation law. Any violation of the law would be subject to a fine of up to $10,000 and a substantial violation would be subject to up to $100,000. Fine amounts would have to account for the severity of the alleged violation. While OP shares the commitment to deter illegal work on historic properties, we are concerned about the severity standard and the very high maximum that this that this bill would enact. Introducing an express severity standard would add a level of complexity to the task of preparing and prosecuting a notice of infraction, both because the severity is undefined and it will require both the Historic Preservation Office and OAH to weigh relative harm of violation. If severity is to be added to the law as an express standard, we suggest it be defined based on the extent of the unapproved work and the potential for the property to be restored to its pre-violation appearance. The $100,000 fine would undoubtedly garner attention and could have the 
and could also have the unintended consequence of increasing opposition to the preservation program itself. This would be unfortunate given that such a high fine amount would be difficult to justify in all but the most rare and severe cases because it far exceeds the maximum fine for other property related violations. To address these concerns, the maximum fine amount in the bill should be reduced to 25,000. Additionally, to avoid the perception that historic district homeowners will be frequently subject to outsized fines, a fine greater than 10,000 should only apply to willful violations of preservation law instead of to substantial violations. This concludes my testimony. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cozart. Do you have a, can, can, do you know how often HPO issues fines for improper construction in historic districts? So in the past, let's see. Um, could you repeat the question? How often does HPO, Historic Preservation Office, issue fines for improper construction in historic districts? So I would say for context, we've issued in recent years uh, about 30 to 60 stop work orders. We've also issued a, about 40 to 70 corrective um, or correction orders and 30 to 70 uh, infraction notices on an annual basis. You said infraction notices and what? On an annual basis. So maybe to just restate, um, about 40 to 70 correction orders per year and 30 to 70 infraction notices per year. And then you said 30 to 60 stop work orders. Correct. Um, do you have a sense that uh, unscrupulous LLCs see these fines as a cost of doing business? So... Um, what we've observed is a few things. The, the reference to the um, Maple View case is one that we've certainly uh, learned something from. In that case, it, it wasn't about the fines. They just wanted to cut and run and, and be so unscrupulous that they put those infractions on the next homeowner that, and, and the homeowner wasn't aware. Um, it's not clear that a hundred thousand dollar fine would have changed that situation. And so, you know, when people are being unscrupulous, it's it's um, the deterrence. It depends, I think, on the individual is how I would respond to that, or the LLC, as it were. Speaking of the Maple View, which I didn't know of, um, so should we be making a change in the law with regard to uh, title? Uh, I, based on our experience, it's worth examining. Um, it, uh, yes, it's worth examining. I know that doesn't tell me anything. So you're right. <laughs> uh, I would be happy to have, uh, a bit more of a, give more specificity. Um, uh, our legal counsel isn't here today. So I just want to make sure that I'm offering something that's helpful and, and also, um, uh, uh, relevant to the conversation. So would be happy to have a follow-up conversation specifically about that. Or maybe a follow-up letter. That, that could work. That looks at Maple that View and says on the basis of Maple View, uh, maybe this is what we should or should not do with the law. Sure, we'd be happy to respond to that correspondence. Um, in your testimony, you noted that there can be a tripling of fines up to nearly $15,000 in practice. How often has this happened? That is a good question. Just give me a moment. So I would say, um, I would say, generally speaking, um, I, 
I would say generally speaking uh, that um, it, it doesn't happen that frequently uh, because it happens on occasion, but it doesn't happen that frequently um, because we are focused on the cure. Um, now you said that each day is a separate violation. So one could get to $15,000 in three days. Uh, my sense is that doesn't happen. So how long does a violation have to continue before it gets to a tripling? So um, what we do is as homeowners are trying to and property owners are working to correct um, the, the counting of the days, you know, as, as we start working with homeowners, um, that plays into when we assess something else, when people are not trying to come into compliance with, uh, a corrective order, that's when the counting begins again. This is sort of unrelated to the bill, but are the current fines credited to OP's budget or HPO's budget? Um, I'm no, they are not. You stated in your testimony that extremely high fines of $100,000 could create opposition to the preservation program itself. Can you discuss how you balance this concern with the need to establish more severe penalties for intentional violations of preservation laws? Well, certainly the way we see it is uh, for those who are willful and not trying to bring something uh, into compliance, that is where we can do the doubling and tripling uh, of fines in the case of the Maple View case. Um, that is something where we sent uh, a fine in excess of twenty seven thousand dollars. So that's the so those are the ends of the spectrum where you have homeowners that, you know, it was not intentional. Something is is out of alignment with what the permitted work was. They clearly want to bring it in alignment. So that you, you we divine the difference between willful ignoring our uh, um, ignoring our stop work order, ignoring um, the the corrective order. When that's willful, that's that's when we see where we need to go to the higher amounts versus um, a lower amount. You know, thinking about Mapleview, which again I didn't know of until today. Um, why would the fine follow the property as opposed to the uh, developer? Say that again. Why would why would the property why would the fine follow the property as opposed to the developer? The property didn't commit the fine. The developer did. The developer sold the property, but that doesn't get the developer off the hook for his or her bad behavior. So the infraction follows the property. The fine for the infraction. It, the 27,000 that I spoke of is towards that development, that previous developer. That's where that's going. And that was my question, why? Why would it go to the developer? Why wouldn't it go to the developer? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Why? So a developer acquired this property, mm -hmm. violated the law, mm -hmm. it's a $27,000 fine, sells the property, the new owner finds out when they want to do something that, oh, they got a fine they have to pay. Oh, well, so why wasn't it uh, the fine should have attached to the developer rather than to the property? So that that the fine is attaching to the we have attached the fine to the developer. So the, what I'm saying is the 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 improper work is still on the property. And we work with the, the current property owner who is working towards a cure. We work with them on a cure and, and have uh, to date settled that, to my knowledge. Have settled it. Have settled that infraction issue. So to my knowledge, there's no longer, there's no longer an infraction 
assigned to that property. However, there is a fine assigned to the developer because of the, the actions that that developer took that had the property out of compliance. So that's, I hope that helps to clarify. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, at your performance oversight hearing, uh, as I recall, there was quite a bit of testimony from folks, I think mostly opposed to the Chevy Chase Historic District designation, which may or may not occur, saying that historic preservation is horrible and is counter to housing and affordability, similar to what we heard today. And my recollection is I asked either the Office of Planning or HPO if they would come up with a fact sheet. Have you all done that? We are still working on it. We will certainly have it to you before our uh, budget hearing. <laughs> I'm chuckling. Um, I mean, I, I think it's important that the program get ahead of this, uh, this theme that uh, historic preservation is actually um, harmful. So um, I, it's probably best if I answer with the two-pager. Um, what we're trying to do is pull it. We, we've been sharing that. We've um, put together um, uh, development guidelines for Connecticut Avenue, and this came up uh, as a topic, and we certainly addressed it head on, head on about how kind of opportunities for infill exist and how you take advantage of those and providing more um, uh, guidance that allows for that to happen. And part of that is um, really understanding that there can be a balance of these things. And we promise we'll, we'll get you that two-pager. Okay. I mean, I live in a historic district, so I have a house that uh, if I want to replace the windows, I have to comply with the guideline. If I want to replace the windows, it's going to be expensive. Not because it's a historic district, but because windows are expensive. And so maybe I won't get to do plate glass windows. I'm in the Capitol Hill Historic District, there are no plate glass windows. I have to do windows that have uh, whatever it's called, the uh, four up or whatever. I'm not doing very well here. Um, but it doesn't mean it's more expensive. It just means that I have to have a style that's, that is compatible with the historic district. Uh, and that message needs to get out there as opposed to that um, the historic district uh, increases cost. How does the a Historic Preservation Office or your office work with district agencies when there are historic building code violations? Again, district agencies talking about DC government properties. Sure. So uh, as a proactive measure, we certainly um, meet with agencies to provide them with um, information, updated information as it relates to how to work with us um, and uh, how to make sure that they are uh, following um, historic preservation law. Uh, additionally, we have um, staff who uh, have developed deep expertise in working on uh, city government projects um, over the many years. And uh, we, we um, engage that way. And sometimes the best way to learn about it uh, is through working on a project. So those are a couple of ways. I'm over my time. I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Councilman Burr. Thanks. Um, I have a meeting I have to run to, so I'm just gonna ask one question. Follow by quick statement. First again, thank you for you and your staff for working with us on the bill. Um, I wanted to focus in on your comment though about saying that you believe that it should, the, the maximum amount should be changed from 100,000 down to 25,000. The way the legislation is drafted, it is up to $100,000. If you believe there should be a $25,000 fine, you're totally within your right to do $25,000. We put, it, we put a, um, a ceiling, not a floor. And so by bringing it down to $25,000 as your ceiling for what you may find to be the most egregious violation out there, you're left at $25,000 on a two and a half million dollar home that's utterly destroyed, you're left with a 1% fine. Um, you're gonna roll in the costs, right? So that's why keeping a ceiling that is higher at 100,000 is what we had initially laid out in the legislation. The way, you, the way that you outlined it made it sound like you might have thought it was requiring $100,000. So I just wanna clarify that and ask, why not have the 100,000 as your ceiling? But then obviously the agency is able to help figure out what that structure looks like. 
So I appreciate that question, uh, council member. Uh, the idea that one could perceive that $100,000 per infraction, and we see ourselves as continuing to uh, add on to that kind of gets you even higher, you know, mm -hmm. uh, up to 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. And so the there part of it is about, is there going to be a push to uh, higher fines um, uh, based on the fact that we are allowed to do it um, based on some of the testimony that you've heard today. And so that wanting to make sure that people understand that the idea of around our historic preservation law is really, um, as Ms. Fuller was talking about, really to, to make sure that the character and make sure that the elements are that are important to us stay in place. And um, we just wanna make sure that we're thinking about something that's in alignment with the other violations that com other commensurate violations, whether they be health and safety violations that you might find, um, we just want to be commensurate with those. So that's yeah. where our opinion comes from. The motivation helps to understand where your motivation is coming from. So I appreciate that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I have just a couple more questions. Um, in your testimony, part of your objection to the way the bills are drafted is it says uh, the severity is undefined. So if we define it, that goes away as a problem. Yes. But. And um, uh, I think that's, uh, as I shared in my testimony, the, the, I think part of it is about um, making sure that um, it's clear that we're talking about willful violations um, uh, of, of a historic preservation law. I think that's, that's um, I think, yes. Of course, Definitely. the problem with willful is that means then you have to prove intent. True. And intent is hard to prove. Yes. Um, in fiscal year 2023, a total of $50,000 was recovered through fines and application fees and application fees. That seems a bit paltry. Do you have enough inspectors? So uh, it is, we have uh, uh, three inspectors as stated, and we have uh, a host of um, staff, including legal staff uh, who assist in the enforcement process. We also have uh, managerial staff, and then certainly our permit reviewers also are part of the enforcement uh, uh, process and system as well. Yeah, but the permit reviewers aren't out in the field looking at uh, when there's a complaint. They are not, but certainly they're giving guidance and advice as it relates to corrective actions and the cure portion of it, which is really important to us. Uh, yeah, but uh, do you have metrics on how long it takes to respond when there's a complaint? We, uh, that may be... Um, not super easy to get, but certainly we can follow up after this hearing about what, what information to that extent we can provide. What does that mean you'll follow up? Uh, we will send you uh, a note following this uh, hearing about um, uh, this question of uh, how, what are we able to track as it relates to the time of report of an, uh, of an issue versus, um, and how long it takes to get to a cure. So you don't have metrics, but you'll get back to me about how, to what extent you can answer that question. Correct. I mean, wasn't there testimony from one witness about, uh, calling and, uh, 
inspector showed up the next day or when it was too late? I did hear that testimony. Um, I did hear that testimony. Uh, and that's one uh, um, case that we can look into and specifically uh, because I recall there was a, we have a general location, I think, for that. Well, to what extent do you coordinate with Department of Buildings who also does not have enough inspectors? So if you can't get to a complaint that one of them can show up? There's regular coordination. Um, it helps that we're located in the same building um, and regular meetings that happen to coordinate uh, uh, enforcement. I think the cadence of those might be once a month and to be able to kind of check Yeah, that wasn't things. quite my question. So okay. I call in and I complain that the house next to me is uh, a historic district and it doesn't look like they're doing all that demolition, doesn't look like it's consistent. And uh, who, I don't know who takes that complaint at OP but or HPO, but uh, they know they can't send somebody out that afternoon. Do they get on the phone to the Department of Buildings and say, hey, can you send somebody out? That's what I meant by I see. not monthly meetings. I see. Um, so that's part of the coordination to provide that 24 hour coverage related to compliance. Give me just a second. I think that's it for my questions at the moment. So if somebody took notes on what you're getting back on? Yes, the two pager and uh, how we answer your question, uh, to what extent we're able to answer the question, how long it takes to get from, uh, to get a cure uh, from uh, a uh, report. And uh, also Maple work. View. And also Maple View. As and Maple View. We changed the law regarding title. Yes. Or I was hoping that you would send a letter. No, that you no. will send a letter. I'm going to send the letter. Got it. With lessons learned and how, whether we should change the law regarding uh, May in light of Maple View. Got it. So those uh, are my think, three things. I think we'll leave it at that. Um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. As I indicated at the beginning, this is a hearing on Bill 25-576, Protecting Historic Homes Amendment Act of 2023. The record in this matter will close in two weeks at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Time is 410 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned.